Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for showing up tonight. Um, this is our second series in Burning. Um, my name is Ryan Jackwood. I'm the Science Director for the Harpeth Conservancy, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our organization if you're not familiar with us. Um, our vision is clean water and healthy ecosystems for rivers championed by the people who live here. And we, we work in basically four major priority action areas. Um, our first one is clean water protection, and that's kind of our legislative Our legislative policy um, kind of environmental action um, area of our organization. We've got river science, wildlife monitoring and restoration. Um, and that's kind of our uh, the science section for our organization. We do a lot of um, research projects. We do some um, water quality sampling. Um, we do some restoration projects. And so that's kind of who the area that I'm in charge of. Um, we have a rural protection land use area, which is really kind of land development and um, sustainable development. And then finally, we have our community engagement and leadership building um, action area. And that's a lot of our outreach education um, tonight would fall under that kind of priority area for our organization. Um, we also do in-person programs called Lessons on the River and they're hands-on in person. Um, we, we practice social distancing and um, we're in masks. Um, and so the next two that we have coming up on um, November 29th and December 6th, we're doing um, hikes in two of the Harpeth State Parks. Um, you can find this information on our website, um, but we're gonna have, uh, these hikes are gonna be led by um, one ranger named Lisa and another ranger named Bill. Um, they're very knowledgeable. They're going to be really informative and, and do a really nice job at these kind of um, structured hikes. So if you're at all interested in, in joining us on those, then um, definitely come out. Our next conservation conversation is going to be in December about holiday recycling tips um, and kind of like what wrapping paper to buy to recycle and what to do with food waste and all of that kind of thing that surround, surrounds the holidays. So kind of a sustainable way to, um, to practice um, kind of our holiday traditions. And then our kind of upcoming fundraising events, we've got on December 1st, we've got our Rally for Rivers kickoff um, and Giving Tuesday. Um, and so look out for emails about, about those two different events. And then we also, brand new this year, have a Harpeth Holiday Bundle. And so that's some of the merchandise you can, um, you can purchase from our website, but we have it bundled for a sale price and it, it you know, would make a great holiday gift for, for anyone who's interested in that. And then um, here's kind of some other ways that you can get involved with us or volunteer. Um, we've got a specialty license plate if you're interested in. Um, can stay connected with us on social media and we also have Amazon Smile and then Kroger Community Rewards that you can sign up for too that benefit our organization. So enough about us tonight. Um, we've got two great speakers, um, Tim Phelps and Hattie Bennett, and they're going to be talking about um, kind of backyard burning and um, kind of we as citizens what we can do to kind of prevent air pollution and what kind of the rules around um, kind of burning in our yard. Can Thanks. everyone hear okay? Uh, we, we, I had a message from someone saying that they were having trouble hearing. Can everyone hear okay? Everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so this is kind of the rough agenda for tonight and I will shut up here and let um, our AmeriCorps, um, Ellie, um, introduce um, our, our first speaker, Hattie Bennett, and um, enjoy what these two great speakers are gonna have to talk about. So thanks everyone for coming out. And I'm gonna unshare Hattie and you can go ahead and share your screen. Ellie, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yeah. our first speaker? I was just waiting for her. Oh. Nice looking PowerPoint to go up. Um, <laughs> hi everyone, I'm Ellie. I'm an AmeriCorps member serving with the Harpeth Conservancy this year as an environmental outreach and communications coordinator. Um, we're super excited 
about tonight, um, being that this is our first series and now the second part to our burning series. So I'm gonna introduce Hattie. Hattie Bennett grew up in Southwest Florida and moved to Middle Tennessee with her husband and three daughters 10 years ago. She currently lives in Lewisburg and works out of the Columbia Environmental Field Office. Hattie serves as an inspector for TDEC's Division of Air Pollution Control and is the lead in environmental education outreach. She attended Oregon State University and holds a bachelor's degree in environmental science with a focus on anthropology and fisheries and wildlife. I'm gonna hand it over to you, Hattie. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so as she said, uh, my name is Hattie Bennett and I'm an inspector uh, for the Department of Environment and Conservation's Division of Air Pollution Control. My presentation will provide you with a brief overview of air pollution and we'll discuss state regulations and processes as they relate to open burning. So who is APC? <clears throat> air pollution, the Division of Air Pollution Control is directed to maintain the purity of air resources in the state of Tennessee consistent with the protection of normal health, general welfare, and physical property of the people while preserving maximum employment and enhancing the industrial development of the state. The division directly serves 91 counties within the state and oversees and assists the actions of Davidson, Hamilton, Knox, and Shelby counties, which all have their local air pollution control programs. So this is just a picture um, of how the field offices are designated certain counties. I work out of the Columbia field office, which is in blue, and the little stars kind of represent where, um, where the field office would be. So what is air pollution? Air pollution consists of gases or particles in the air that can harm the health of humans, plants, and animals. And it originates from both natural non-regulated sources such as wildfires, volcanoes, and lightning, and human created sources such as automobiles and industrial emissions. So many human created sources are regulated. Um, a good example of what the Division of Air Pollution Control would regulate would be uh, factories or industries that um, make products that you use every day uh, and they emit air pollutants into the air. So they would have a permit and um, we would make sure that they followed their permit conditions and um, followed the regulations. So there are um, several different types of air pollution and we can break them down into two categories. The first category is particle pollution. So particulate matter is a complex mixture of extremely small particles and liquid droplets that get into the air. Once inhaled, the particles can affect the heart and the lungs and cause serious health effects. So this picture shows um, typical small particle pollution that um, the Division of Air Pollution Control will be concerned with. Um, the larger of the two is called PM10, which is um, things like dust, pollen, and mold. And um, it is approximately 10 microns in diam diameter or larger. Um, it's depicted in this picture on this piece of human hair um, as a little blue circle. So um, it's pretty tiny. Um, more concerning is called PM 2.5, and this is a little red circle, which is on the blue circle on the human hair, and those are um, the things that we're most concerned about, consisting of, um, for example, combustion particles and organic compounds and metals um, that would result uh, possibly for, from prohibited open burning. The other category is gaseous pollutants. Gaseous pollutants are much smarter, smaller than um, particle pollutants. Um, most of them are colorless and odorless, making them undetectable to our, sense, our senses, even in high concentrations. Um, a good example of that is carbon monoxide. Uh, a lot of us probably have carbon monoxide detectors in our homes or probably in our workplaces. They're definitely in our schools. Um, and that's because these gases uh, can be deadly even um, and undetectable even in high concentrations. So unlike the particle pollutants, which you can imagine as like snow 
in the air. They um, float in the air. Gaseous pollutants um, mix with the air and can sometimes um, mix with other pollutants to uh, make different pollutants. Uh, a good example of this is ozone. So if we take um, uh, for example, nitrous oxide, um, and we mix it with volatile organic compounds. In the presence of sunlight, you will get ozone at ground level, which is a pretty um, unhealthy pollutant in the air. So what is open burning? Open burning is defined as the burning of any matter under such conditions that products of combustion are emitted directly into the open atmosphere without per passing directly through a stack. Open burning includes, but is not limited to, fires located on the ground, in a pile, in a barrel, in a fire pit, or other semi-enclosure. So I put some pictures on here for you to look at. Um, that are defined as open burning, even though they're kind of um, in something or um, somebody has constructed something. These are examples of what open burning can look like. And I've seen all kinds of examples of places that people have constructed to contain their burn. Um, and it uh, they, they will say that it's not open burning, but it is important to recognize that all these different types of containment devices are still considered open burning. More, more often than not, open burning is a process of incomplete combustion and depending on the contents of the materials being burned can lead to large quantities of particulate and gaseous emissions. So prohibited open burning. Um, in summary, prohibited open burning uh, for disposal purposes should only consist of natural wood or natural vegetation in an untreated form. Um, so there are some exceptions um, to open burning in the state of Tennessee. Um, examples of that are fires used for cooking food or for um, recreational or comfort heating purposes, barbecues, campfires are okay. Um, also uh, pre-approved fire training by responsible fire control persons, not an individual, but um, a fire station and the firemen is fine. Um, fires consisting solely of vegetation grown on the property of the burn site is um, allowable and fires consisting solely of pure untreated wood for disposal purposes is allowed. Um, in the regulation, one of the um, more notable paragraphs is the open burning of tires and other rubber products, vinyl shingles, siding, other plastics, asphalt shingles, and other asphalt roofing materials and or asbestos containing materials is expressly prohibited. Um, expressly prohibited that in those bold items do not, um, it's not limited to just those items, um, but they are expressly prohibited and looked at a little bit differently. Um, but essentially everything aside from pure untreated wood waste or vegetation grown on the burn site property is um, not allowed. So um, this slide will further define wood waste and vegetation. Um, we think of wood waste as uh, a product that has not lost its basic character of wood. Bark, sawdust, chips, and chemically untreated lumber um, are, are good examples or something to think of. Um, a lot of a lot of people get confused and think that particle board or um, paper, cardboard are wood waste and they are not. They are all, have all been treated with something, whether it's um, glues or formaldehyde or a bleaching product um, to make them uh, function as they would um, as a piece of paper or a piece of cardboard um, or a piece of plywood. So they are not considered wood waste. Um, additionally, wood waste is not considered a plant life that is um, soft like the leaves or needles or grasses, flowers, um, yard clippings. Those are all uh, described as vegetation. And these are important because 
um, vegetation not grown on the property in which it's being burned has some additional uh, rules associated with it. Um, but first, the, the restrictions for open burning wood waste. Um, so there, there are pretty few of them as long as it's pure untreated wood. But um, if you are going to burn wood waste within 200 feet of an occupied building, um, there are some rules that apply. Um, so say I wanted to, um, I collected some sticks on my property and I wanted to burn them up um, for disposal purposes. And I was within, I was about 150 feet from my neighbor's house. Um, I would have to make sure that I stayed with the burn the whole time, uh, that I didn't do that more than twice a month and that the fire was completely out in less than 48 hours. And if I was even closer than that, say I was 75 feet from that uh, neighbor's house, I would have to have the written permission of an adult that lived there in order to um, burn that pile of sticks in my yard. Um, the restriction for open burning vegetation that is not grown on the property of the burn site um, is a little bit different. Um, burning cannot be within a half mile of all these um, all these things listed here hospitals nursing homes schools um, national parks state wildlife areas um, and if it is not the person burning um, must submit in writing and certify the distance requirements within 10 working days prior to burning so this would be a pretty um, rare occasion to where like a city municipality maybe did a very large collection of leaves um, and maybe, maybe after a storm or, or something to that um, effect and took it somewhere else that they felt was more safe to dispose of um, all of that um, all of that material and so and this would generally not be something that would be on an individual basis um, generally if someone rakes up a pile of leaves and they want to dispose of it by open burning they do so on their own property so um, an example of something um, that may occur and that I've encountered uh, where we had to um, go out and and instruct the the property owner that they they couldn't burn what they were burning is um, someone had gone to a farm supply or, or some sorts and um, acquired some uh, some hay or some straw and they were using it as bedding um, for their animals and um, after they were finished using it for the animals they piled it up and they burned it up and um, that is an example of open burning vegetation not growing, grown on the same property. And um, so that was not allowed. Um, some other considerations um, aside from those that I just went over is even though um, you may be burning just wood waste on your property and your uh, further than 200 feet from your neighbor's house. There are some other considerations. Um, the technical sec secretary or air pollution control um, may require a person to cease or limit open burning um, if emissions from the fires are deemed by the technical secretary um, to cause a public health issue or create a public nuisance or safety hazard um, or interfere with the attainment or maintenance of air quality standards. Um, so maybe an example of, of uh, when this might occur is uh, perhaps I was going to um, burn up a pine tree that had fallen down on my property, but it was awfully close to the road and um, the wind was blowing in such a manner that um, it, it caused a traffic or a safety traffic hazard um, because the smoke was thick uh, from the sap of the pine tree and um, it was causing people to have a hard time um, seeing driving. And um, any, ex any exception to the open burning um, prohibition 
does not relieve any person of the responsibility to obtain a permit required by another agency or um, complying with other applicable requirements, ordinances, or restrictions. Um, for example, uh, burn permits that are required for the, by the Division of Forestry during October 15th through May 15th are still applicable. Um, you have to follow those rules as well uh, as the state rules. Um, in some other county or cities, they have more stringent rules as well. So um, you may have to obtain a city burn pit permit or a county burn permit, and that is the responsibility of the person doing the burning to um, find out what those um, requirements may be. And similarly, no local ordinances or provisions shall override the state regulations on open burning. So um, there, there are a lot of places that um, are very rural and um, they don't know our, our rules. They've never heard of them. And um, they may assume that since there are no local rules that they don't have to do anything special with regard to open burning. And um, just because they don't have to acquire a burn permit in their um, specific county doesn't mean that they do not have to follow our rules. So that, that's kind of what that means. So who is responsible? I've gone and I've um, <clears throat> burned some prohibited materials and um, then, then I left, I went to work and I'm a renter. Who's responsible for that, that burned up material or that prohibited burn? So, um, the individual who starts the fire is responsible for the burn. However, if that individual cannot be identified, the owner of the property in which the burn takes place is responsible for incidents of prohibited open burning that occur on their property. This is true even if the property owner did not cause or allow someone to cause the prohibited open burning. It's the property owner's responsibility to affirmatively take the necessary steps to prevent active op prohibited open burning on their property. So if, I'm, if I am a renter and I um, am burning my garbage in the backyard and um, I go to work and the neighbor calls air pollution control and I'm not there, um, the Division of Air Pollution Control will contact the property owner and they will be responsible for that act. Um, notable is the maximum civil penalty for unlawful acts of prohibited open burning is $25,000, is a Class C misdemeanor and could result in criminal prosecution punishable for up to 30 days of confinement and a fine up to $10,000. So some of the negative effects of air pollution, open burning emits large quantities of toxic pollutants into the air. Um, as we said in, in the first few slides, um, there's particulate matter that's involved and there's also gaseous pollutants. So um, it depends on what's being burned, um, but if it's things like plastics and um, vinyl and asphalt, those have some um, pretty bad uh, air pollutants associated with them, especially if they're not um, completely combusted. So um, there's, there's a whole range of health effects and um, effects on the environment associated with these um, large quantities of toxic pollutants that are emitted. And depending on the size of the, the burn, um, it can be anywhere from anything from the next door neighbor has asthma and my backyard burning irritates that to someone who decides that they are going to collect tires and burn 10,000 of them, which would have a community, more of a community effect. So um, complaints of prohibited open burning, um, if you're, if, so we've already gone over um, what you can and cannot burn. And so everybody knows, but what do we do if, our, if someone else is, is open burning and you're impacted by it? Um, you would probably want to um, contact the Division of Air Pollution Control and not try to um, make the person put out the fire yourself. 
um, and you would contact the field office that was associated with your county. Um, this is, a, again, the county delineating map, which shows where um, the, the field offices are and which one you would call if you uh, had a complaint of prohibited open burning and you can remain anonymous. Um, all we would require is the address so we could go and investigate the complaint. Um, the complaint will be logged into a public data viewer and assigned to an APC staff member who would investigate the complaint within five business days. And then following that, if the complainant provided their contact information, we would notify them of the results in writing. Um, so what had happened as a result of that complaint. But again, um, that's not, uh, is not necessary for the complainant to provide their con contact information. Um, a lot of people choose to be a neighbor or someone very close to them and they would prefer not to be known. Um, so that concludes my presentation and um, I thank you all for keeping Tennessee air clean. If you have any questions, I think we're going to have a question and answer following um, Tim's presentation. And if you would prefer to email me a question directly, that's fine also. A big thank you to Hattie for her presentation. Like she said, if you have any questions, go ahead and type it into the chat or make a note and we'll be able to have a discussion following Tim's presentation. And while he pulls up his slides, I'll go ahead and introduce him. Um, so Tim currently works as the communications and outreach forester for the Tennessee Department of Agriculture Division of Forestry. In this position, Tim is responsible for public and media relations, the general promotion of forestry as a discipline, and the role the division plays in protecting and serving. What was that? Um, and the role it plays in enhancing the forest resources of Tennessee. Um, he also spends a couple of weeks each summer working for incident management teams on large wildfires as a public information officer. And prior to his work in Tennessee, he spent eight years at Penn State University working as a research support technologist. He's a graduate of Southern Illinois University where he received his bachelor's and master's of science degrees in forestry. And additionally, he has been a longtime member of the American Chestnut Foundation and is very active with the Society of American Foresters. So with that, we'll hand it over to Tim. All right, thanks everybody and uh, good evening. Uh, happy Wednesday to you. Um, so as Hattie mentioned, uh, with TDEX air pollution control, they cover a lot of what you can and cannot burn. Um, what I'm gonna focus on is specifically on a, a, a source of that that you can burn, which is vegetation generated on your site. So my talk is gonna be very specific to that category uh, as far as uh, pollutant, putting pollutants in the air and, um, and permits required around uh, uh, conducting that activity. Um, but before I do that, I kind of want to dig into why we do that. Um, and the real reason, quite honestly, is because of wildfires. Uh, nine out of 10 fires, wildfires are started by people. And that's a nationwide statistic. Um, honestly, here in the East, it's probably even somewhat higher than that on a percentage basis. Um, out west, you have things like uh, lightning, um, other natural um, events that cause uh, wildfire, but here in the east, predominantly, it is people. Regardless, fire is a part of the landscape uh, in, in whatever forest we're looking at, and, and Tennessee included. Um, but part of what our agency does is work to prevent unnecessary wildfires. We see fire as a tool in many regards uh, where we use prescribed fire uh, to create vegetation habitats, control um, uncontrolled wildfire through mitigation of fuels um, and other reasons. But for the most part, uh, what a, a lot of what our agency does is work to control um, wildfires as they, as they come about. And escape debris fires is consistently one of the most um, common causes for wildfire in Tennessee and throughout the Southeast really. In fact, um, 
I know many folks are aware of a lot of the big wildfires that occur out west. They're big mega fires. The reality is Southeast has, the Southeast has more wildfires per year than any other region in the nation. We just keep them at a very small size um, and, and they're, they're manageable uh, much more quicker. But uh, this particular chart here, I just wanted to pull up, shows the last three years, last three calendar years of wildfire activity in Tennessee. You can see 2017, and by the way, that these are, I'm sorry, these are, these are fiscal years. So these are June to July. So if you see 2017, it's very high. That's because that includes that fall fire season we had back in 2016. Uh, many of us who were around for that know we had fires going from really it started in late September and all the way bookended to that horrific fire in Gatlinburg in, um, in late November of 2016. So the acreages that you see there on the left, that's 75,000 acres, uh, corresponds to the uh, number there on the right of 1,291 fires. Uh, and that's a, a typical average. We look at a 10 year average and that's, that's about um, the number that we see uh, average per year. It's about a thousand fires per year. But you can see a trend and it's a positive trend. Our acres of wildfire have gone down since 2016, substantially. In fact, uh, in 2018, although uh, that included some, some, some statistics there that included 2017, uh, we had the lowest number of uh, acres and wild, uh, number of wildfires that year. So um, we're under a good trend. If you wanna look at it even farther, here's some more statistics to look all the, all the way back to 1960. You can see there the top chart shows fire occurrence by year. Um, and what I want to point out here is the agency, Tennessee Division of Forestry, started issuing burn permits. And late, it, it kind of took a little while to go statewide, but it started in the late 80s and it grew into the early 1990s. And you can sort of see a pretty decent trend there where that number drops off of fire occurrence by year. And again, that's because about half, 50% of our uh, wildfires in Tennessee are caused by escaped debris fires. Um, we look at acres burned by year. That number is also going down over time. We have that spike in 2016, uh, mostly because of uh, that, that Gatlinburg fire, which was 17,000 acres, um, contributed a great deal to that. But we also see the average fire size per year has gone down over time. So I wanna go back to the top and reiterate the fact that we started implementing permits in that uh, early 90s timeframe, primarily to control escape debris fires. And while I would love for that to be the sole statistic that, you know, that that was a great tool that solved uh, that problem, which it certainly had a part of it, uh, we also saw since that time, a great um, increase of population within the state of Tennessee. So you got more urbanization going on maybe fewer people burning the way that they used to, um, cultural shifts uh, throughout the state. So there's a number of reasons beyond that. Um, but sometimes it's really just interesting to see the stats and how we're moving over time. And it really, again, this is a trend we love to see. Um, we're going down in the terms of the total number of acres that burn every year. And we are setting records for low number of wildfires per year. So we're heading in a really good direction. Um, and, and honestly, getting a burn permit is, we think, a big part of that. It is our division's way of telling a landowner that wants to, again, burn that uh, legitimate, re that legitimate uh, fuel type, vegetation generated on their land, to clean their, to clean their yard. Maybe it's uh, leaves falling from their hardwood trees or branches uh, that accumulate throughout the yard. Uh, it's also a very safe practice to do that, especially if you live in a, in a wildland urban interface where you're kind of out in the woods, um, but you've got a lot of that flammable material around you. And that is exactly what our wildfires in Tennessee burn, are those leaves that fall um, every year and those twigs and branches that can accumulate. So it's a good way to keep your landscape uh, fire-wise in the sense that you're removing that fuel in advance of a wildfire uh, that's coming to your area. And of course, anybody that lives uh, in an area that has steeper slopes uh, or rockier soils may be more prone 
to something like that. And we have programs uh, that encourage landowners to implement throughout uh, the year to better protect their homes because they are that first line of defense. And there's a, a, several other uh, programs that we work with volunteer fire departments, uh, municipalities and others uh, to encourage landowners and others to do that kind of activity. But primarily, again, the number one cause typically on a, any given year is escape debris fires. And that is your typical backyard fire, your, your pile of leaves or pile of twigs in the backyard. Um, and as Hattie mentioned, you know, that's a, it's a, it's a material that you can burn, but there are restrictions um, to do so, primarily staying with your fire. But that's really what we're trying to, to promote here through the burn permit um, requirement system. So as mentioned earlier, between October 15th and May 15th of every year, uh, the permit is required. There are local restrictions uh, often in place to where a municipality has their own restrictions that supersede ours. So if you live in an area that, uh, if you live within city limits, you're gonna wanna check to make sure that, uh, that there's, that there's uh, no restrictions in that, in that case or what those restrictions are. If there's not, you do need to get a permit from us. And this is also a great example on this website, by the way, this is, we're looking at burnsafetn.org. Uh, this is, site was recently upgraded this past fall uh, for a launch on October 15th. We're really proud of it because the old site was around for 10 years. It had really old, <laughs> outdated wallpaper on it. Uh, it functioned well for getting a permit, uh, but we have a lot better information on here now. It's a lot easier to obtain a permit, especially on your phone or any other mobile device as the site is mobile responsive. Uh, but I did want to point out that we do communicate quite regularly with TDEC and um, we are aware of their rules. They are aware of our rules. So in a way um, we scratch each other's back and, and um, we have our areas of expertise and our areas of jurisdiction. Uh, but in, in regards to getting information out to those that want to burn, there is cross collaboration here. And there's a link there to uh, TDEC's open burning guidelines directly on our burn safe site. What you find on, on this site, first of all, is um, a lot of education. We're trying to educate the burner to do a debris burn safely, because it can be done safely. We issue around 350,000 permits per year, and we have about 1,000 fires per year. So if you do the math, that's less than 1% that actually escape. And some of that, those escapes can get quite nasty, but quite honestly, most of them are contained rather quickly. Uh, but that can be done safely. Again, it's our way of telling that burner when, where, and how it's safe to conduct a debris fire. But before they even make that decision, we do like to offer, there are alternatives to burning, composting being a primary one, you know, raking your leaves, um, providing some habitat for things like um, lightning bugs. Lightning bugs like to uh, reproduce under um, a canopy of, of uh, hardwood leaves. Um, certainly the leaves, uh, the amendments they provide to the soil, enriching the soil for uh, nutrients and uh, water runoff and things like that. So there are great benefits um, to, to consider in terms of um, looking at, 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 at mulching or some other practice or composting. But that said, uh, we do also recognize that removing that vegetative fuel through fire is a very efficient way to do it. We just wanna encourage everybody to do it safely. So we walk them through a series of steps that are listed here. Um, and then getting a permit is one of the key factors moving forward. So I'm gonna list some of those uh, do's and don'ts with regards to conducting a debris fire here in a second, but uh, just wanted to start here. Here's a really good example of a couple that is taking a lot of good precautions in conducting this fire. And I wonder if everybody wants to use uh, the chat here just to name a couple of things that they can see that this couple is employing that we're gonna review here in a minute. But what are some things that they're doing um, on with that, with that leaf pile that uh, is a safe way of conducting a debris fire? And while you're punching those, those answers in, I'll just read here that again, Burn permits are our way of telling you when, where, and how it's safe to conduct a debris fire. They're required between October 15th and May 15th of any year. 
The state forester can actually extend that period based on conditions. In fact, we did that last year because we had a very dry fall as we were coming into it. In fact, we started permitting uh, much earlier at that time. Um, anyone starting an open air fire within 500 feet of grassland or woodland must by law secure a burn permit from the Division of Forestry. Um, permits are not required for burning in containers such as a metal barrel with a half inch mesh screen cover. And anyone needing to burn within an incorporated city should contact city authorities about any local burning ordinances. Uh, because they have their own rules. And like I said, those supersede ours. Um, <clears throat> give me just one second. My TV automatically turned on in the background. All the joys of uh, Zoom calls from home. Sorry for that distraction. So you all mentioned uh, a few things here in the background. What are these folks doing? Um, they have water buckets, yes. Uh, wildfire, any fire for that matter, requires three elements to burn. We call it the fire triangle. It requires heat, fuel, and oxygen. You take away any of those arms of the fire triangle, you could take out, you knock out the fire. And what water does is it reduces the heat and it also reduces the oxygen. Um, Let's see, what else was mentioned? The hose, yep, if you can reach a hose, another great thing to have around. The shovel ready to throw dirt on the fire, that is an excellent uh, example, that's right, it does the same thing. It reduces the oxygen and it cools the fire. Um, fire retardant effect, well, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, so great examples of those folks that have, the, the lady also is holding a rake to keep, uh, any embers that might fly away to put back in there. So um, do wanna say that permits are free of charge. There's no charge to get these things. It's just our way of, again, communicating where, when, and how it's safe to conduct a debris fire. Uh, we don't want folks attempting to burn when conditions are just not conducive to do so. And in fact, we will not, as it says, it says here in bold, we will not issue permits on days and in locations where we don't think it's conducive to do it safely. That does not, is, that does not um, um, translate into a burn ban. A burn ban is a different situation to where conditions have deteriorated for a period of time, drought specifically, uh, in certain areas of the state where we're probably going to not issue permits or not allow burning for an extended period of time. Um, in this link on burnsafetn.org is uh, a, an example or a little bit more information about burn bans and when they might go into play. Currently, there are none in play. Um, we've had a very wet year and um, really not a whole lot of threat out there with regards to escaped debris burns. So just wanted to point that out, that not issuing permits does not mean burn ban. It's just our way of saying today's not safe to do it. We're not going to give you one. Try again tomorrow. Um, mentioned again here what materials may not be burned. Uh, Hattie did a very good job going all through that. But these are the points that I really wanted to get, the tips to conduct a safe debris burn. First of all is check for local restrictions. As I mentioned, in this state, if you live outside of any municipality, you need to get a permit through us. Um, and uh, that's just required from October 15th through May 15th. Now, if you live within a municipality, you are gonna to wanna to check to see if they have any restrictions that supersede the states. And there are many municipalities across the states that either have their own permitting system or do not allow burning at all. Davidson County being an example of that. Davidson County does not allow uh, leaf and brush debris burns to happen. Now they do allow container burnings. If you have a little fire pit on your patio, you can do that, but you cannot burn a pile of leaves or brush in Davidson County. As a courtesy, it's always great to notify your neighbors. Um, and it's also good to notify your, your local fire department. If they're going to see it. They're going to wonder if it's a, if it's a, you know, they're going, they're going to get concerned. Is it going to escape? Is it going to come burn their house down? So just let them know, hey, I'm burning a pile of leaves. 
planning to do it at such and such time. I've got a permit uh, to do it today at uh, you know three o'clock and plan to be done with it by five o'clock. So just a courtesy to let them know. As y'all pointed out above, always good to keep water and tools handy to control embers. You don't want it to get away on you. Uh, one of the best tools is your brain, okay? Keep your, keep your piles small and manageable um, because uh, if you start to build it up too large, it's a lot easier to get out of control. So keep your piles relatively small, keep, uh, keep a bucket of water. If you've got a hose that can reach to it, even better. Uh, but certainly things like a, a rake or a shovel do just as good to keep those embers from escaping and flying away. One thing that concerns me with this image, they did a great job in clearing the leaves down to that grass, which is nice and green. But little embers, if it gets windy, could fly away up over here uh, to that and, and burn that pretty easy. So you wanna, you wanna stay with that fire and, and make sure that doesn't happen. Um, a step above what they didn't do here is establish a fire break around your pile. It's gonna depend on the, the size of the, the fire break depends on the size of your fire. The bigger the fire, the bigger the pile, uh, the wider the uh, fire break you want to create. But basically, you're going to dig down to bare mineral soil. You don't want any vegetation in that fire break at all because soil doesn't burn. But grass does burn. Uh, if I back up to that image up here, I guarantee you the, uh, the grass, the green grass right around the edge, the perimeter of that pile will dry very rapidly as that fire burns and could start on fire itself and eventually spread. It'll spread slowly, but it could spread and start a wildfire. So be careful with that. So establish fire breaks around there just by digging down into bare mineral soil. You always wanna watch the weather. Um, today was a fantastic day. Actually, it was a really good day to burn. Um, you had a little bit of a light breeze um, but if we were to look at the, at, at, at the weather forecast, we would have seen it's going to stay the same pretty much all day. So great sign for today is a good day to burn. But um, if it starts out with a day like today, but uh, the weather can change in the afternoon, uh, it'd be a lot more difficult potentially to control, especially if you get a lot of winds that pick up. So we're not gonna issue permits on days where we're expecting uh, major changes in weather patterns. And I will alert you, it looks like Thursday could be a, uh, a pretty interesting day as far as uh, winds and dry weather go. Potential red flag day, which is our worst day for, for wildfire. That means dry, relative humidity is low and uh, windy weather. So we may not be issuing permits on Thursday. Always good to plan ahead know what that weather situation is going to be like to plan. To help out, we've provided a link to fire weather forecasting. And I'll jump up here to that tab if I can see it. Sorry, my... Um... There we go. We've got uh, fire weather forecasting zones across the state. Here in Middle Tennessee, we'd, we'd have the Middle Tennessee fire weather. There's a different station for the Cumberland Plateau, East Tennessee and West Tennessee. But you can jump on and get a description of fire weather uh, to help you plan your burn. Here's exactly where it talks about what's coming up potentially on Thursday. So if you're planning uh, a day off on Thursday and planning to do some yard work, break those leaves in your yard uh, and twigs and, um, and burn them. Um, Thursday's probably not gonna be the day to do that. You might see improvement on Friday. Um, so just, just keep those things into consideration. Okay, so watching the weather, controlling the fire while you're with it. Keep in mind, and Hattie mentioned this too, who's responsible? If you lit it, it's your responsibility. If it's on your property, it's, on, it's your responsibility. Your fire is your responsibility. Um, again, try to keep your, your, uh, your piles small. Be sure you have enough help uh, just in case it, it gets a little dicey and uh, you need some help controlling it. Number one rule, actually they're all number one rules, but 
this one is kind of a no-brainer, but it's quite honestly probably why we see the most escape debris fires, which is stay with your fire until it is completely out. It sh by completely out, I mean it should be cool to the touch. You should be able to put your hand in there and not feel any heat coming out of it. Too often or not, a lot of people like to burn on Fridays. A lot of people like to be burn on um, Saturdays. So it is important uh, to stay with that fire. Don't go in and watch the football game. Uh, if your iced tea is getting low, um, have somebody else bring you out another one. Stay with your fire until it's completely out. So those are the, the do's and don'ts, the precautions. Um, I want to stress that these small permits or these small, I'm sorry, these small, small fires, uh, per, these small debris piles, uh, you don't need to call to get a permit anymore. We used to have a restriction if it was larger than eight by eight feet, you needed to call to get a permit, but you can now do that online. Uh, just go to our online permitting system and it walks you through. It takes literally two minutes to go through here. It spits you out a PDF permit at the end if we are issuing permits for that particular day. Um, and if you had the question, I'm just going to, I know I'm running short on time here. A lot of uh, the, the items that we talked about already are reiterated here because we really want to drill that into people's heads. But what you see is where, which county you will be burning in. I'm guessing many of you maybe are Williamson. Uh, you will see if you go to get a permit in Williamson, it will tell you which of those municipalities in that county uh, have local restrictions that supersede ours. So for instance, if you're within Brentwood city limits, you need to call that number and ask them about uh, burning. Fairview, they don't allow it and others. If you're outside of those city limits, you need to continue and work through the system to get a permit on our end. And I'll sort of leave it there. This is the last screen uh, before the actual details that you enter on where and what you're burning. Uh, but it is a really simple process. It's free. Again, really, it's just our way of saying where, when, and how it is safe to conduct a debris fire. And with that, I think I'm out of time, so I'll just leave it at that and uh, take questions. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, I'm scrolling up here. I know I saw that we had a question from William asking, do backyard fire pits from Home Depot slash Lowe's require a burn permit? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> we get that That's a, good answer. a lot. Um, <laughs> So, so uh, yeah, those fire pits and campfires, you know, we don't issue a campfire permit for everybody camping in Fall Creek Falls. That would just be crazy. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's not required for those. Uh, that's considered a ceremonial fire. Okay. But we certainly want to encourage folks to be safe with it. What becomes an issue is a gray area of a bonfire. You know, you take it out of that, fire pit from Home Depot and you, you put a firing and Hattie was showing some great pictures there earlier about <laughs> quasi contained fires. None of them were contained. Uh, yeah. But if, uh, if it gets to be rather large, call and, and get a permit. And if we're not issuing them, it's probably a good idea and maybe not to do that. Um, yeah, Tim, and, uh, oh. I want to, I want to jump in on that also. Um, I guess uh, my, my response would be more of a, it depends I would definitely check with your local ordinances to see if you can indeed even have an open uh, uh, burn. I know um, uh, some apartment complexes, some residential areas, they don't allow any burning at all. So it's always a good idea just to um, double check things. Sure. And um, the other thing I'd like to mention is a, a neighbor of mine informed me one time and said, you know, Jane, I never get a burn permit. And I said, you know, it's always a good idea. Uh, one, one of the first questions your insurance company is going to ask you is, did you have a permit? <laughs> so it's always a good idea to really, you know, even if it's outside the burn permit season, it's still a good idea to go ahead and get one. Yeah. And burning without a permit during season is a class C misdemeanor, punishable by a $50 fine or potentially 30 days in jail. So there is that motivation too. So I I know we're kind of getting close to out of time here. Um, if anyone has any more questions, kind of just throw them in the chat and if people need to take off, then that's totally fine. Um, I'll stick around for another minute or a couple minutes. Um, but what I did want to say is that we also kind of are really concerned about burning too, because if we see some of these larger burns or some of these kind of wildfires take off, they really can impact our rivers. 
Um, we see when it you know rains and we get a lot of particulate matter, a lot of ash that can get in the rivers. It can really have kind of a detrimental health impact on on kind of rivers. So I did kind of want to tie that in there too a little bit of like you know why our organization is is kind of worried about safe and and kind of sustainable burning um, and and kind of a matter that you know where we're you know worried about permits and where we're worried about kind of having these controlled burns versus you know these you know kind of the wildfires that can get out of control and can have you know impacts on air land and water and so that's certainly something that we all kind of need to be be aware of um, any kind of last minute questions before um, before I hand it over to Angela to do her final little Goodbye, hurrah. <laughs> well, this is Dory, um, the CEO of Harvest Conservancy. And, and I actually, um, Tim, have three acres. So one acre is in warm season grasses. So, and we have a, we're in a county area. So I've been doing some controlled burns to manage that. And so I've learned a lot of that over the years. Um, and even our, our larger community we're in, we're sort of in a, a, a large lot, little pud neighborhood. And so we have a burn pile and we get the permit every year. But I'm surprised how many people want to just burn a pile of leaves when they've got plenty of acreage to just make a compost pile. So I know you were touching it, to hinting at that, but it's like some of this burning, I'm just wondering, is it really necessary? Do we want to try and discourage some of it anyway? Like why do we burn some sticks and leaves anyway? Yeah, I think part of it's cultural. Folks grew up doing it. So they, yeah, you know, mom and dad exactly. did it, so they continue to do it. But you're right. There are a lot of good alternatives to it. And some of that's just education and you know, there is some of that going on probably through organizations like yourself mm -hmm. um, that would, would encourage that vegetation to break down naturally. Like I said, it provides yeah. great ladybug habitat. I mean, we just don't have many of those, or not, not ladybug, but um, lightning bug right. habitat. So those types of things, absolutely. Um, I guess my message for today, considering the short time, is just to make sure that folks do it safely and know that it needs to be done safely. But yes, yeah. and prescribed fire too is another great subject area to talk about on. Yeah, exactly. As and you mentioned tool. that earlier in terms of trying, I think you were talking about people maybe with larger properties and trying to manage some of the fuel, mm -hmm. which uh, which is a whole different dynamic, which sure. I'm familiar with, you know. Yeah, yeah. and that, a lot of that, and, and, it, and it goes to Ryan's question too, is, is about what's your objective? What, mm -hmm. what are your primary objectives you're trying to accomplish? Burning off of warm season grass is a fairly simple one because that encourages that vegetation to grow back up. Uh, burning for wildlife habitat could be, um, uh, it is one of our most common uses of prescribed fire. Right. But if you're doing it in an area with a heavy slope next to a stream, you got to take that into consideration because mm -hmm. you're going to get a lot of that sediment that's going to run off after that burn and and come down into the um, into the stream and we encourage too. This is a hardwood state. Um, I love our hardwoods. I love our hardwood industry. I love the fact that we are a top five hardwood lumber producing state in the nation. We make great things. We have great woods like white oak, red oak, walnut that goes and makes beautiful furniture. It supports our whiskey industry, which I love. Um, it supports a lot of great things. Um, burning in those stands. Don't do it. Don't ever do it because you will ruin that product and you won't know that you ruin that product until 80 years when it's time to harvest it. So that's a message that often goes unnoticed as well. So there's a right place and a right time. It's a very efficient, prescribed fire is a very efficient tool for a lot of different things, but it all goes down to your objectives and you need good land managers in there making those decisions, keeping that water clean, keeping those hardwoods protected. Um, I think those are great things for us to keep continuing to focus some of these topics on because a, a lot of people aren't aware of all that, that sort of level of sophistication or even where to go get someone in, like in your department to go give them advice on doing how to manage a forest that they have. And um, so it's very important because I'm, I'm amazed at how few people know some of those basics. Right. Tim, I want to thank you so much for yeah. sharing the, your website with us. I think that's very helpful. It's a great resource for a lot of different people. And Hattie, um, uh, thank you so much for providing us with the map of where the uh, environmental field offices are and how folks can get in touch with folks. And um, you know, once again, if you see anything that presents a, or promotes a, a danger, you know, call your local authorities first and get the fire under control. And then uh, once again, you know, if you do need to report those, I think it's great that there are different reporting channels. And it's always great to know that you can call the uh, Department of Forestry and, and uh, get some tips about, you know, should I burn, should I not burn? You know, what are some other things, some alternatives? So we really appreciate what you guys have offered tonight. 
And I hope everyone has enjoyed uh, this session and hopefully you'll be for our, our next one in December and we will continue these. Uh, Thank you all for joining us. Look for a survey and uh, we'd love to have your feedback um, and we will be recording this as well. Um, and you can watch this or share this um, with your friends and stuff. So if you enjoyed it, please um, give us some feedback tomorrow when I send out the survey. And thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Thank you.